I'd like you to turn in First uh, Corinthians to chapter nine. One of the uh, one of the values of um, a social anthropological orientation to your reasoning, to your thinking, to your planning, to your educational perspective, and to your theological perspective. Is I think it allows you to read and hear things with greater attention to the context out of which the statements, writings are perceived. <coughs> this particular chapter 9 in 1 Corinthians is one of those chapters I think that if you have a high sensitivity to context and you are willing to trust yourself to project back into what's going on there, you get much more out of the words. If you read the words just as flat words, as statements you know, from the great book, great statements that are obviously true because they're in the Bible, and don't ask yourself, what's going on here? What's the nature of this conversation? What's the nature of this, this uh, interaction that you're hearing part of? You, you just read it flatly. And you just understand at one level, and you don't get the richness of the whole thing. Now, granted that uh, any good Bible expositor can make a story like this come alive, and it doesn't take a social anthropological orientation to uh, to make this chapter come alive, but it sure helps if you're in the habit of thinking sociologically, especially. And today, I want to emphasize sociology side. So to bring this passage in. Um, Paul, we mentioned yesterday, uh, writes sometimes in, in, in ways that demand a lot of his reader. And it's easy for us as modern Americans to criticize that because we are so accustomed to media meeting us more than halfway. Uh, we're used to reading things that are shortened. Our, our newspapers that we sell are like USA Today, where sentences are never longer than 12 words and where words are generally themselves never longer than eight or, eight or nine letters, and the ideas are extremely simple and direct. Uh, we're used to television that comes to us and says, see this, think about it, and bang, bang, here are a couple blows to the side of the head so that you sure do it. And he was telling him almost reaches out and just grabs you and says, sticks your nose right in the data and just won't let you go and then bounces you on to something else. We're so accustomed to that, that to bring the energy of thought to bear on reading is sometimes difficult for the American. And um, I, I say that rather carefully, because although others in the world might be roped in on that same criticism, you know, it's, it's pretty much gotten to be a pretty American kind of a thing. To, um, to be treated that way by the media. And if you look at even Canadian uh, broadcasting, Canadian uh, television, and certainly British television, it's it's just not that way. The, the, the British have come to the point where they've got a, what you call a dusty, dirty channel, down at the bottom for people who can't think. And uh, then people who can think can listen to some of the other channels and, uh, and be stimulated to think. Here we almost have to turn to a channel that is importing a BBC program to get anything that really asks for thought. I'm going to ask you as you as you look at this chapter, we're going to look at a good bit of it, it's going to take some time. I want you to think about the context here and ask yourself what is the what is the social drama of this situation? What is the sociology of this context? Chapter 9 starts in a, in a kind of a, an abrupt way, after Paul has just finished uh, a, a, a kind of, uh, uh, well, let's, let's read it at 11. You see the difference here between 11 of, of 8 and 1 of 9. So this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Now, he, he's he's really doing a kind of a, a moralizing here, moralizing on a kind of a sermon level. 
And he's, he's also then at the end of it identifying himself. And he's all of a sudden limited his freedom to do as he pleases. Because in, in, the, in the last verse there, therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. In other words, he is putting himself under a kind of religious constraint. But he does it not because of his adherence to a rule, but out of his concern for the well-being of another person. He doesn't even say, if, if eating meat causes God to be displeased, I will never do it again. He says, if eating meat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never do it again. He's, he's motivated then by the concern that he has for a colleague or a brother. Now with that ringing in your ears, then he bursts out. And if I were doing this on a dramatic stage, I'd have him at this point come forward and do almost a Shakespeare, a mock Shakespeare kind of thing. And to kind of kind of read it that way for a start and think of it. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord Jesus? Are you not a result of my work? Now what would what kind of approach is that? If a person came on the set stage Sounding like that, what quality of character would he be representing? Assurance. Gentleness. <clears throat> Kindness. <clears throat> brotherly love. Well, you tell me. It almost sounds self-oriented to a fault. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord Jesus? Are you not a result of my work? Woo! Paul, oh, hey, hold, hold on here. See? You get the sociological picture here. Where is Paul positioning himself at this point? He's positioning himself with authority and status, particular status. Shouldn't I have a right to talk like this? After all, don't forget who I am. Do you see it? Now clearly he's doing this for effect. It's a, it's a dramatic effect. I think Paul was capable of being very dramatic. Probably one of the reasons he was a, a, an effective uh, teacher in, in, in intercultural situations. He was a dramatic person. <clears throat> Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. Now, do you know that people don't respond well to that kind of identifying with them? You look at people who are, who are culturally of one sort. You're from a, a different background. You're a different sort. I come up to Bob and I say, Bob, you know, you've got a lot of white friends that don't don't really understand where you're coming from. But surely you believe that I do. Is that is that going to gain ground with Bob? What do you think, Bob? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. It's, it's, it's moving in on someone else's territory. You never move in. You can get invited in, but you never move in on someone else's territory. And everybody has his boundaries and his borders. Everybody has his sensitivities. And if you say, well, this is Bible time. This is 2,000 years ago. They didn't reason like that. They didn't feel like that. They didn't think like that. Baloney. Human nature hasn't changed that much. Human sociology hasn't changed that much. The structure of relationships hasn't changed that much. 
clearly Paul is engaging deliberately here in an excursion into a behavior and a style that he wants to point out is not his style. So he's really setting up a contrast. The contrast he's setting up very skillfully is a contrast with his real self. But I have heard people read this passage and without bothering to put the emphasis in it, without bothering to say, what is he, where is he coming from? What's he doing here? They just read this thing off as so much more biblical groaning. And the, the meaning just absolutely slips away from it. He is setting the scene for saying, how would it be, folks, if I talked like this all the time? What would you think of me if I talked like this all the time? If I came on every situation and said, look, I'm free. I don't know about you, but I'm a free person. Now, we know that Paul on one occasion did, as a legal argument, say, hey, you can't do that to me because I am a free citizen, a citizen of a free city. The city of Tarsus, as a matter of fact, which was treated by the Romans as a free city. You can't push me around like that. Sure. But how would it be if, he, if that was his style? If that's where he had positioned himself sociologically. And what he's doing is very skillfully, because he understands that, he can easily then flip it over live that way, sound like that for a few moments until you're saying, hey, that begins to smell. And then he says, indeed it does. And that's what he will do later on. But the point is that in the first part of nine, you've got to catch it fast because after having kind of snuck up on it in this matter of the, uh, I, would, I would even back away from meat if it caused my brother to stumble, which sounds very gentle, humble, and properly responsive as a Christian. He goes into this 9-1 and he goes, bang! And he's in a totally different character. For you are the seal of my apostleship. For this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Now here it is. How often do you find Paul saying and doing defensive things? Do you understand defensiveness? Do you understand how defensiveness in human relationships works? Do you know about defensiveness as a, as a posture? Do you know about the sociological structures of presuming a defensive posture? What happens if you are defensive? You lose all the initiative. You lose all the initiative. All you're doing ultimately is reacting. Have you ever seen defensive Christians? Do you suppose that Christians understood a little bit better how it weakens you? sociologically, to voluntarily go on the defensive? Do we have quite so many doing it? I wonder. Here's what he does. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to take food and drink? Now here he begins again to assert rights. A typical assertion of the defense of the weak. Oh, how should I have rights too? You don't step on my rights. By the way, what uh, what nation does that remind you of when you start hearing people declaring their rights? Or have you grown up American? <laughs> Even as little kids, we have little pat phrases to say about, hey, I have some rights here too, you know. Up that way? Do you have any of those things to say? Don't we have the right to take food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other disciples and the Lord's brothers and see this? Come on, I have a right to do that too. He uses a nice, polite plural here. Don't we have the right? But he's talking about himself. <laughs> Don't I have a right to do this? The other guys do. Hear it? The other guys do. Could, shouldn't I do that too? Can't I do that too? He's whining. He's going to be whining. Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Tell me the truth. Did you ever see the whining in that phrase before? Can we read that one? We quite commonly read right past that one or turn it around and use it for a totally different purpose. 
You don't really have a right to do this. These other guys do. And, and of course, Paul at this point was very likely not married. And he's trying to get sympathy for it. You understand the process of getting sympathy? That's another good way to win friends. He is absolutely caricaturing or just demonstrating the opposite of the way he really is. For a purpose, as you'll see coming on. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? He's still whining. That verse is usually read as part of a protestation about the importance of paying the people who are in ministry. Well, folks, watch out. The original use of it was he was whining. Who serves as a soldier in his own? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? No, the law is on my side. Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. It is, it is about oxen that God is concerned. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us, because when the plowman plows, the thresher threshes. They ought to do so in the hope of sharing the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is, is, it, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from among you? Hear him whining again. If we've done spiritual things, shouldn't we expect you to help pay for it? On and on, he just, he just seems to rub it in. If we have sown, uh, if others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? You know, if you're if you're supporting some other folks in ministry, how come you're not supporting me? But we did not lose this right. There's his transition. You've heard all this. You've heard all this ego stuff. You've heard all this defensiveness. We have not used this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, those who serve at the altar sharing that which is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive the living from the gospel. The seed goes on the attack now. I have not used any of these rights. In other words, His declaration has been prefaced by this theatrical moment. Please says, let me show you how it would sound if I were to behave in this kind of offensive, self-centered, whining posture. And it's all based on the assumption that my rights have to be preserved. And what does he say about those rights? Don't use them. Don't call. Don't. I don't count on them. I don't call on them. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this post. I love it. I love it. I don't use those. In fact. I would rather die than have somebody prove me wrong on this point. See, Paul is very assertive, even aggressive. He is not defensive. And he is not a whiner. And he comes down to say it centers in what we see as our rights over against what is what it is we see as our privilege. And our freedom exists as we understand our freedom in Christ, not as we understand our tactical freedom as person having rights. I would rather die, verse 15 and 16, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. I have to do it. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may make, I may offer it free of charge, and not make use of my rights in preaching. 
Though I am free and belong to no one, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Under those, to those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under God's law, so as to win those who are not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some, that I might share in his blessings. That's where he's going to all this. That crucial passage is often memorized as an extremely important piece. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Where does that motivation break down? for many Christians. And this is why the whole chapter is so important. It breaks down because in this caricature behavior that he puts up in the first verses, you see several characteristics that infect human nature and can even infect Christian behavior. Preoccupations with one's rights, What else? What are some of the other things you can see in that character? These are the things that get in the way of that adaptability and flexibility that he describes in verse 22. I become all things to all men, so as to that by all possible means I may save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in the blessing. What are the, what are the things that get in the way? Authority. Hmm? Authority, wanting to... Wanting to claim authority and to work by authority of oneself. Good. What else? I think whining itself, the uh, the mental attitude of, of a kind of um, false depression, kind of feeling sorry for oneself. What else? Past, is there? past successes. Yeah. Good. Just simply going on the basis of the past successes or the status that has come from past successes. Good. It's a beautiful chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. It's a beautiful section because it deals very, very clearly as would a person who has a particularly keen social anthropological perspective and is able to see relationships, status, and how these work positively and negatively into effective communication. Is there, is there a possibility that um, some of these characteristics he identified himself with are some certain characteristics that the Corinthian culture valued? I think we have to assume that. I think we have to assume that. But I, I, think, I think that whereas that's more than likely logically true, there's also a bigger picture, and that is what makes the scripture the scripture. There's not only an application to the Corinthian problems, but there's also an application to the human problems. And uh, that's the beautiful thing about the canon of scripture. Uh, many of the disputed books, if you read them carefully, yeah, they apply uniquely to certain kinds of uh, problems, but those aren't my problems. Whereas this one, I can say, yeah, that's probably the Corinthian problem, but it's also my it's, problem. Yeah, yeah, it's also true. your yeah, problem. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure that's what he's stimulated by is, is how do I communicate effectively to the church in Corinth? But I think he does this by putting himself into that sound mm -hmm. that allows them to say, hmm, that's a funny way for Paul to tell the sound. Can you imagine a person hearing that letter being read in the church for the first time? You know, one of the unfortunate things is that most of us have read all the Bible in one place or another, and uh, it's it's not fresh again, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get it fresh again because you're rereading. And uh, if you had never heard that before, and you heard that section, starting out at, at nine one, and our brother Paul says, "Am I not free?" Our brother Paul <laughs> says, "Am I not an apostle?" Our brother Paul says, "No." Woo! Doesn't say. Got my attention. So, well, he got my attention. And then he says, Let me show you something. 
That's all true, but I haven't built my work on that. I haven't called upon those rights, that status. There's the, there's the big difference. But you see what I'm driving at is Paul was keenly aware of how that works. He was keenly aware of those qualities, those characteristics. And, and mark my words, never read the Bible as if people no longer are like that. Quite the contrast. I'm amazed how many Christians will get so carried away in their exegesis that they say, well, now you've got to understand this was in a different time. I say, cry manently. You're worse than the, uh, than the evolutionists. The evolutionists want a million years to make that much change. And you want to make that much change in 2,000 years. Come on. Things don't change that fast. Human qualities persist. Uh, I also find it interesting that he lays out all of these rights. And I, I wonder, reading this passage, if the Corinthians, because of the way Paul really was, mm -hmm. uh, you might have seen him as super laid back, and maybe, you know, maybe he really wasn't that committed or whatever. Yeah. To to the task, he wasn't making any demands. He wasn't. Um, he was working uh, by vocationally <coughs> for the ministry. And um, um, clearly he says here, he says, yeah, this is part of the reason why I didn't do this. This is a, you're looking at me, yep. which really brings up a, a, a really cultural look at it. They're looking at his, yep. his service and saying, man, he's just so laid back. He's not, uh, he's not asserting himself like all the other Old time. And, yeah, what's, what's his problem? <laughs> and he was really yeah. committed to this. And then he has to say, well, let me explain to you the motivation behind why I've done what I've done. Good. Very good. Would two of you volunteer leaders of prayer? Godfrey, who's who else? I need a second. 